in this, this uh, message, I want to believe in God, but, and there's a number of, uh, a number of topics that we've covered, and uh, today we're going to be talking about a killjoy, God. If you've got a bulletin, there's a spot on the bulletin for you to take some notes and just follow along, and that might help you. It helps me. I like doing notes, um, but it's on there, and um, so uh, I want to believe in God, but there's a number of reasons why people... Um, know about God or know God or or had an experience with him once and have walked off but there's a number of reasons why things keep us away from serving God faithfully and what we're and I think what what I'm saying is most people are not what we said this last week uh, when people reject God most people aren't rejecting truly God they're rejecting their their distorted view of what they think God is and today in particular Today in particular, I want to talk about something. I want to talk about, I want to talk about all the rules and regulations because many times I've had conversations with people that say, well, you know, God is a God of rules and regulations. There's so many things to follow. It's just, it's too much. That's not who God is. That's what man made him. He's not a God of regulations and laws and rules. You say, are we allowed to do whatever we want? No, but we'll talk more about that later and you'll see why. I want to believe in God, but God, right? Last week we talked about, but God doesn't do exactly what I want. He's not my on-demand God. I prayed for somebody who was sick. I prayed for my husband or my beloved one or my, and God didn't do exactly what I said when I said it. Therefore, I have a hard time believing in him, not understanding that he's not mine to control. He's not a remote control. He's God. It's my place to find out what he wants from me, not my place to explain to him what he ought to do for me, right? And of course, this week is, is what, as I said, a killjoy God about the regulations. Next week, we're going to talk about a goosebump God where it's all based on feeling. It's all based on feeling. There's nothing wrong with feelings, but we don't base our faith on feeling. It's the very same thing as getting married or being in love with your spouse. And one day you wake up and you feel in love and everything's great. and You're going on a picnic. And the next day, and this is going to happen if it hasn't happened, all of you who are married say amen. There are going to be mornings you wake up and you don't feel in love right that moment you're kind of annoyed at the fact that whatever he burned dinner again or he forgot to or she did this or she and so you don't know but you don't base love you don't base relationships on feelings and yet when it comes to christendom somehow there's a great number of believers who've decided that unless i got goosebumps god isn't real that's not the way that it works how can you believe in a god that lets all these bad things happen that's week four that's week four, heartless God, and we'll be there in a couple weeks from now. So this is week two and three weeks, and that's one of the most important ones. A heartless God, how can God, if he's up there, allow so much tragedy in this world? And we're going to talk about that. See, God doesn't cause the tragedy. He didn't cause the sin. He didn't cause us to fall from what we were supposed to be. But he did cause us to have a way to get back to him. That's been since the Garden of Eden. Since Adam and Eve, God has been trying to rescue us, trying to get us back, saying, I know, I understand what you did. There's a price that has to be paid, but I want you back. And that'll be week four. So um, let me just talk about today. Let's move into what we're talking about today. I want to talk about what I call this killjoy God, right? Uh, which I want to believe in God, but there's just so many rules. And, and, and is that what it's about? Following the rules, following all the laws. So many do's and don'ts I could barely keep up, right? As a kid, that's how I felt. That's how I felt. It was all just watching Christians. It was all about do this, don't do that. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to think that. It was, it was really all about a lot of legalism. And there's all around me that I'm watching these people who are claiming to be Christians, but they were imperfect. Because how many know even Christians are not uh, at all <laughs> perfect? Hello? We never will be, right? It doesn't make us a hypocrite. It simply means I know to humble myself before God regularly and say, help me. Help me. Draw me closer right? Uh, I think still people today say Christians aren't perfect, and I think that many people look around at Christians and they say, well, look at how those people live. Look at how those people live. So why should I want that? So why should I want that? My life is okay. Pastor, I'm kind of a nice person already. What do I need that? Why should I follow a God who tells me to do this and don't do that? Well, here's some good news and some bad news, right? Good news and the bad news about Jesus and religion. Now, we're going to start with the bad news about religion. And when I say religion, I'm not talking about faith. 
I'm not talking about real Christianity. I'm talking about all the rules that we attribute to it, religion, all the things that we made it complicated with. Right? There's a difference between Christianity and religion. And so here's the bad news. Again, if you're taking notes, it's in your bullets and there's some spots to fill in. Religion focuses on the external. It focuses on the outside rather than the internal. By nature, we tend, we tend to put on people around us whatever our definition of religion is. What do you mean? I mean, if I grew up a certain way and my paradigm dictates, indicates to me that here's what I think religion is, here's my relationship with Jesus, here's my experience, here's my history, and I've decided because this is my empirical evidence, this is what I've experienced, that if this is true for me, it must be true for you. That's religion. Because you don't impose on someone else what God has placed on you. Our faith is not based on experience in history and tradition. Our faith is based on the word of God and what he says, right? It's so easy to accuse a spouse or a parent or, or a close a co-worker or a close a relative of somebody said, oh, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. Oh, well, they're just, they're just such a hypocrite. They're just such a hypocrite. Why? Because they don't look like you do. Because you've imposed things that they ought to be doing. Surely if they were truly Christian, they wouldn't speak like that. But what's their background? What's their experience been? How do you know where God's brought them from? Walk carefully. Be kind. Speak softly. We don't, we don't know where that person came from. God is moving on them like God has moved on you. But it's so easy to lump everyone in together. And we rarely, because we're human, it's human nature, we rarely do we consider ourselves wrong. Rarely do we consider ourselves wrong. If it's wrong for me to watch Fox News, it's wrong for you to watch Fox News. No, it's not. God will tell you what to watch. You pray. You seek. You find out. I don't watch Fox News, by the way. They bug me to no end. That's not the point. At all. I'm like, side issue. Back to, okay. The point is, you see what happened there, though? What I'm comfortable with, what I like, that's what I want everybody else to be comfortable with and like. But people aren't all the same, and we're not all in the same place in the journey from here to the Lord, right? Well, I'm certainly better uh, than the people that I compare myself to. (laughs) That's our problem. I'm certainly better than the people I compare myself to. Yeah, and you're in trouble. Listen, here's one of our texts, and I, I, I pray this sinks in. Maybe take a note, put a bookmark there. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 to 20. We're going to stay in Matthew 23 for a while, a, different, a couple different spots, but we're going to be in Romans as well. So Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. Here's what made Jesus angry. Angry. Jesus was angry with these people. Here's what he says. What, and he didn't sin. He was angry, but he didn't sin. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You are hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. In other words, they're putting on this big religious show on the outside, but they were treating people like garbage. They were treating people like garbage. In verse 26, he says, in verse 26, blind Pharisee, first deal with the inside. Clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will be clean as well. See, religion, the external stuff, tries to close the gap to a holy God, between us and a holy God, with outward human effort. If I can look spiritual, surely I must be spiritual. Hogwash. I've seen a lot of spiritual-sounding-looking people who are just, oh, God bless you today, brother. Then they get out to the car, and they're like, oh, gosh. Tell me that hasn't ever happened to you. You're in the car. You're on the way to church. The kids were late. They didn't eat breakfast. Something spilled in your lap. Coffee, whatever. You come into the church, and you're like about to kill somebody. And the minute you step out of the car, someone's there to shake your hand. What are you going to do? Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm so blessed. How are you? And that's not being hypocritical. That's you saying, okay, well, I can't take it out on this poor person. But it is true of us. I don't know why we think we're supposed to be so polished all the time. And if I ask you, how are you doing? I expect you to tell me how you're doing. I don't expect you to say, oh, everything is fine, pastor. If it's not fine. If it's not fine, I expect you to say, it's not fine. Oh, there's a novel idea. Maybe we'd be honest with each other. Now, that doesn't mean that you go to the person and say, good morning, how are you doing? Well, do you have three hours? Sit down. 
right? Like, that's not, it's not always time for that. But you know what I mean, being fake versus being real. You know what I mean. So we try to close the gap between us and God sometimes just by working harder. Sometimes we can feel there's a deficit. There's a blank spot in my heart. I'm unhappy. There's no peace. Something's wrong. Between me and Jesus, there's something wrong. And so I'm going to get involved at church and I'm going to work harder instead of going to Jesus. Instead of saying, what, what is going on with my heart condition? I'm just going to do more. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We can be very, very busy working in church. And all that effort doesn't mean uh, that you're honoring God. Well, based on my efforts, Pastor, and based on the efforts of the people around me, I'm definitely doing more, so I win. That's not the way it works. I am therefore holy enough. No. Maybe you're not saying it out loud. You might be saying it. You, you're probably not saying any of this out loud. But subconsciously, what, what does this do? It means you look at people around you, and you look at them as if you're better than they are. You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything overt or, or, or blatantly visible. But in your heart, if you think that because you do more, you're somehow holier than someone else or because you've gone to church for a greater number of years than someone else makes you in some way elite, you're wrong. And that's pride. It's arrogance. It's arrogance. And it allows, and it allows for us to look at the people around us and go, boy, they, they really need to clean up their act. Do we remember that the holiest thing you can do is to do what? To people. Love them. That's the most important thing you can do. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 3. Love is the greatest thing, right? 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 and 3. Here's what it says. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secrets, plans and God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Nothing. There's no little chart in heaven that God is putting a little gold star next to your name every time you check off a box of something that, that you were supposed to do. Now, does it not bless God when you do something good? Yes, it does. We'll get to that. The Pharisees put on this big religious show. Right? We're talking about a killjoy God today. We're talking about a God of, of regulations and rules. And here's the Pharisees, and they put on this big religious show of public prayer. And these long prayers on the corner, not so God would hear them, but so people would hear them. And people would see them and think that they were holy. And they wore these big fancy suits. And they looked the part. And they thought that that was what they needed to do. Listen, if you go back to the Old Testament after Ezra and Nehemiah, here's what happens. The religious leaders began to say, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with some new rules, some new rules to make sure nobody breaks the laws that God gave us. We're going to help God out here. We're going to do God a favor. We're going to add rules. Do you ever do that? No, pastor, I've never added rules. Really? What do you say to your kids as they were growing up? Did you ever add rules? We add rules. We make stuff up. Now, we might mean well, and it might be for the best intention that I say, hey, Julian, right, my own kids, hey, Julian, don't watch that, man. It's not good. I don't like what it's doing to your heart, right? But I'm not going to say it is a, I'm not, I can't look at him and say, it's a sin to watch anything Steven Spielberg has ever written. Like, that's, and you say, well, that's kind of preposterous. Who's doing that? Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating on purpose. We don't actually do that. But in a way, when we say, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, that is what we're doing. Now, am I going to protect my kids? Of course I am. If there's something nasty, I'm not going to let them watch it. Why? Because it's going to hurt their heart. But I'm going to be very clear, and I'm going to say, here's why I don't like that. Here's what this is doing to your thoughts. Here's, what, here's what's in, in your mind. And here's the pictures of your, the window, the, the picture window of your eyes are allowing the stuff in your heart. And I, I don't want you to look at it because it's going to hurt you. Right? 
And there's a principle there. And I'm trying to teach the principle. And that's true of adults as well, right? So they're adding all these laws in the Old Testament. And the law that we're talking about, we're talking about the Torah. This was the law that they had. The first book, five books of the Bible, right? That's what they had to work with. Don't do this, do this, don't do this, right? But they made some extra laws. They made some man-made laws to make it super safe. And what these religious leaders did, there were 600 brand new laws that became known as the fence laws, Defense laws. There were actually 65 laws just about the Sabbath. Just about where you should be and when, right? This is why it's, these are why you can't do church on Saturday. You got to do church on this day. That's not scriptural at all in any way, right? 65 different do's and don'ts about the Sabbath. And they've been around for so long that even Christians will say, I'm pretty sure the Bible says you have to go to church on seventh day he rested. Well, does that mean Saturday? Does it mean Sunday? Who cares? Hear me. It's the principle of it. So these laws, someone compiled all these laws into a book in the third century, and it's called the Mishnah. And if you're Jewish, you're familiar with it. It's called the Mishnah. It's over 800 pages long of man-made laws added to the laws of God to help God out so that we don't get in trouble. And this may help us understand this. This may, just that detail right there may help you understand why Jesus was so angry with them. This may help you understand and, and to get why Jesus was so upset with the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 3 and 4. Go, go, go a little bit before from where we are here. He said, he's telling the people, don't follow the Pharisees. Don't follow the example of the Pharisees. They're not practicing what they, what they teach. They're just loading laws on you. That's all they're doing is loading a burden on you. And you say, I want to believe God, but this is not, you know, there's so many rules. That's not the heart of God. A killjoy God does not exist. Now, the good news is this. That's religion. That's external stuff. But the good news, the other side of it is Jesus. And Jesus, there's a whole other side of it. The good news is Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. Now, stay with me here. The good news is Jesus is internal. Religion is ex- external. But stay, for Romans chapter 3, verses 20 and 23 says this, Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. Listen, all of these laws, right? Here's what it starts with, verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Verse 21, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writing of Moses and the prophets long ago. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in what? Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Verse 23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standards. Three simple thoughts. Here's the first one. Number one, you cannot earn God's acceptance by following all the laws. That's not how it works. I'm going to say that again, in case you're writing the notes in. You cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the laws. No matter how hard you work or try, you cannot earn his acceptance by obeying the law. Religion says your good works are going to make God happy. And that's not true. Jesus teaches me, I cannot be good enough to please Jesus. I can't be good. I can't do, I can't, if you see, here's the problem. The problem is if you're going to follow the law, you've got to follow all of them. And there's no way I'm going to get all of them right. So if my salvation is based on me doing all the laws perfectly, then I'm doomed. Then it won't work. And I can't be saved on my own, in and of myself. No, don't do bad. Don't do this. Do this. Don't, those rules don't make you righteous. They don't make you holy. Well, then why in the world would God give us all those laws? Why did he do that? If we can't live up to it, why did God put them in there in the first place? Well, that brings us to point number two. This is my second thought. Right? The th- second thought is the purpose of the law is to show me my need for a savior. That's the purpose of the law. The second thought is it's to show you your place where you see all the law and you realize, oh, wow, I can't do this. It's too hard. As holy as I think I am, as righteous as I think I am, and all these rules I got to follow, I, this is too much. And it shows me my need For something or someone to rescue me. That's what the law is for. To shine a light and go, look at yourself. You can't keep any of this stuff on your own. Verse 20 says this. 
right? We read it earlier in verse 20 in Matthew 23. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. But the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Remember we read that, right? So we become conscious of our own sin. You know what I have to do to make everybody in this room angry? All I have to do to make everybody in this, you're smirking at me. You're like, go ahead, make me angry. Listen, all I have to do, and now this might not make some of you angry because you've matured enough to understand it, but in most places, if I walk into a room, all I have to do is say, you're all a bunch of sinners. Kaboom. Who are you? To, now everybody's going to be, now I'm judgy, right? Who are you to judge me? Who are you to, to, but here's the thing. It's not me that judges you. It's the law. The law judges you. The law says, compare yourself to me. Can you do this? And the answer is no. There's no way to get it all right. But pastor, seriously, what you're saying, I get it, but I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. Well, yeah, no, none of us are bad people if we compare ourselves to who? Adolf Hitler. Compare yourself to Jesus. Do you match? No. Compare yourself to Jesus. We don't match up. We can never gain that way. We don't gain entry into the world, into, into heaven that way. We all fall short. I want to ask you some questions today. I'm going to ask you to be very, very honest. Okay? Spouses, if, you're, if your husband or wife has a good left hook, you may want to move seats. That's the nature of the questions I'm about. Thank you for that honesty, brother. Thank you for that honesty. Your children will be blessed by that candor, brother. <laughs> uh, be, be honest with me. Raise your hand. Ready? Ready to do this? All right, here we go. How many of you, now just be on, please be on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Look, if you've ever told a lie in your life, raise your hand. All right, now look around, please. Keep them up, keep them up for just a second. If you see anybody with their hand down, you tell them you're lying right now. All right, put your hand down. Okay. Look, I didn't see anybody with their hand down. All right, okay. How do I, you know, and this doesn't have to be a big lie. Doesn't have to be a big lie. How do I look, honey? Great. Lie. Does that make me look fat? No. No, no. Now, I'm not saying I don't want to spare my life, but a lie is a lie. A lie is a lie. Does this make me look fat? No. That's always the right answer. By the way. You'll never see. You, listen, let me just tell you right now. As a pastor, I'm going on record, on video no less, to say, lie like a rug if your wife asks you, does this make me look? F it's a trick question. If you can say nothing and just run out the room, you'll be better off. If she, unless she's faster than you, then just duck and cover <laughs> and hope for the best. Listen, a lie is a lie. A lie is a lie, all right? How many of you have ever, again, please, I'm asking you to be honest. How many of you have ever taken, so in your whole lifetime, even as a kid, how many of you have ever taken something that did not belong to you? Raise your hand. I don't care if it was a paper clip or a pen, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. Again, those of you who aren't raising your hand are lying. That's all right. I've seen Pastor Ben steal the lunch right off my desk. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, he really has. <laughs> all right. Okay. That's fair. Is that, okay. Put him down, right? Even if it was a paperclip. Look, some of you would steal a nice pen in a heartbeat. I know I would. And then you'll sit in church and you'll write your tithe check out with a stolen pen. <laughs> what does God think about that? Listen, <clears throat> listen, last one. And I have to be very clear, abundantly clear. The next thing I'm going to ask, do, watch my words, please, watch my lips. Do not raise your hand Allow me to repeat, don't raise your hand. This is completely rhetorical. And now some of you know what I'm about to ask, right? If you've ever been in here, if you've ever been in here and you've experienced lust, don't raise your hand, right? We can do group counseling after service, right? Well, you, you might have some friends. You might have like, you might have like a girlfriend or, or, or a male friend who'd be like, oh, it's okay to look as, you don't, as long as you don't do act on it. It's okay to look. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, Jesus actually said anyone who's ever looked lustfully at someone has already committed adultery in their heart. It's not okay to look. It's not. Listen, God's standards are really high. They're high. His laws are very difficult. His standards are extremely high. There's no getting around that. It's no joke that 
uh, you know, and, and based on the questions I just asked and what I just saw in this room, basically what we have are a bunch of lying, thieving adulterers. Uh, welcome to HFA, where we love to encourage our people. We're so glad to have you here. You know what I forgot to do when you came in? I did actually forget to do this. If there's anybody here for the first time, make sure you fill out a visitor card and drop it in. <laughs> then if somebody's like, not after that. Listen, listen, here's why this is so important. Here's really, really, truly, this is why this is so important. And, and it's, if it's not important to you, it's important to me. It's important for me, right? Until I see myself as a giant sinner, then I don't have any need for a savior, do I? Until I can acknowledge, until I recognize how, who and what I am, I'll never understand my need for a savior. And I've shared this before. The closer I get to the Lord, the longer I'm in ministry, the more I see my flaws. It's not the holier I get, although I hope I'm becoming more mature, and I hope I'm becoming closer to the Lord, and I do hope that there are things that I used to struggle with years ago that I'm not struggling with anymore, because God has brought me past that stuff. But the truth is, the closer I get to God, the more I spend time, whether it's in counseling or ministry or teaching the Word, do you understand when I'm preaching, I'm preaching to me? Did you know that? When God leads me to speak something and I'm looking through the word and I'm sharing my heart with you and God is saying, this is good, this is good for the body. Guess who's part of the body? Me. I'm preaching to me too. And the closer I get to God, the more I understand my need for a savior. Number one, you can't earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. Number two, the purpose of the law simply shows me my need for a savior. And finally, number three, the thought, the third thought here is being right with God will come only through faith in Christ. That's it. N no ifs, ands, or buts. Water baptism does not save you. I don't know what your theology is or what your background is. Water baptism does not save you. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, does not save you. Taking communion does not save you. Dedicating these beautiful little boys today does not save them. They will grow, and when they come to an age where they have, they have the ability to make decisions for themselves, it'll be up to them whether to accept Christ, to accept grace or not. Those things don't save you. The only thing that saves you is accepting Christ himself. This is what Paul said, verse 22, same, same chapter, verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, period. No matter what your past is, no matter what you've done, you are not worse than me. I am not worse than you. So we want to look at someone else and we want to say, well, they're really, really bad. No, sin is sin. Separation from Christ is separation from Christ, no matter how you cut it doesn't matter how bad your present is right now. When you put your faith in Christ and you humble yourself and you repent, he makes us completely new. Not because I followed all the laws, because I can't. It's not possible. We just shared on Good Friday, right, on Easter, that Jesus was hanging between two criminals. And one of them hurled insults. One of the criminals next to Jesus said, you saved other people. Save yourself and us. Get us off these things. Right? He's mocking him. But the other criminal looked at Jesus with a broken heart and said, Jesus, you don't even belong here. I'm not sure. Why. You shouldn't even be here. I deserve to be here. He literally confesses to Jesus right there on the spot. Jesus, you, don't, you shouldn't be here. I belong here, but you shouldn't be here. Would you remember me when you come into, into your kingdom? And Jesus, hanging on the cross, looks at him, at this other criminal, thief, whatever. I don't know what he had done, right? But crucifixion was the top of the punishment scale, so he might have been a murderer. He might, I don't know what he did, right? And Jesus looked at him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today, right? The criminal didn't earn anything. He didn't have time to do anything. He had time to jump through any hoops. He didn't do anything to earn it, because we can't do anything to earn it, Right? All he did was accept, he accepted who Christ was. He saw him, he said, you know what? You are who you say you are. I can see it. This is the son of God. You, you are who you say that you are. You don't belong up here. And he said it out loud. He believed in his heart and he confessed with his mouth in front of a hostile crowd. Where have I heard that before? Oh, that's right, Romans, which is how we come to Christ. And that guy's saved right there in, in, on the spot. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Listen, there's a story I want to share with you 
a very poignant one I heard a little while ago. Here's something to illustrate what I'm talking about, our need for a savior. There's this uh, luxurious hotel, right? This big hotel, beautiful hotel with a, with a big lobby and the foyer was just, you know, chandeliers and the whole nine. It was a big, expensive uh, grand piano right in the foyer. And there was a little girl, there was a little girl with no musical ability whatsoever. Someone say amen. And, and she's banging on the piano, like for all she's worth. She's just banging away, right? The sound is reverberating in this colossal foyer of this expensive hotel. And people started to get ticked off. People started to get angry. How many of you, if there's a crying child in the sanctuary, start to get a little antsy? Be honest. Thank you. Thank you. All right, note to self, if you have a baby, don't sit in this section right here. Because <laughs> this, this is where the hands were concentrated. Listen, listen, it's bothersome. A, a crabby, a loud crab. Now, I have, as a pastor over the years, I've learned, you know what? I hear babies crying. That's okay. You just brought the church population up by one. That's fine. Let them cry. Right? But I understand it's annoying. It's annoying. It's ag- it, can be, it can be aggravating uh, if a child is making this racket on this, on this piano. So a very unhappy couple of hotel guests went to the manager. And they went to the management to complain and to say, hey, man, look at all this noise she's making. She's not following the rules, pal. You got to go over there. You got to get that little girl off the piano. I think there's even a sign on there that says, you know, don't, don't touch or whatever. And, but the hotel manager looked at the complaining couple and he told them, listen, this little girl's father, he's kind of a big deal. And he comes in here often and he's very wealthy and he's important. I'm not telling that little girl anything. I'm not offending that little girl. I'm not offending her dad. But if you want to talk to the dad when he gets here, you go ahead. So the father did get back eventually. She's still banging away. And the complainers had already worked themselves into a frenzy. They're waiting for dad to show up so they can pounce and complain and shut this little girl up. Creating this horrible sound. But before any of the occupants could get to dad he makes a beeline for the little girl her father he puts his arms around her and he covers her hands with his and they begin to make something beautiful that's your father you're the little girl banging on the piano he wraps his arms around her and shuts everybody up by saying listen I know she's clanging around making a racket, but with me here, it's beautiful. That is what God does for you. That is what God does for me. He dresses me in a robe I don't deserve. His mercy, his grace, his blood covers me when I've done nothing to gain it at all. I know it's just a little story, but it is truly, I hope that you understand, when you accept Christ into your heart, it's not time that you say, well, I guess I have to get everything perfect now. No. He didn't say that. It is acknowledging my humility, saying, God, I can't do this alone. I'm not good enough. I can say that personally standing up here. My mother should be the one saying, amen, you sure can Because she saw how I grew up. Listen, I can say, I can't do this alone. I need Christ. I need him to put his arms around me and take my hands in his and guide me. So that what I do brings honor to him. And it's beautiful. And it's precious. Are you telling us it's okay to sin whenever? No, I'm not. I'm not. I've been waiting to get to the end of the service to share this part. It's not okay to sin whenever. It's not okay for me to just, hey, I'm going to just do whatever I want. And then in the end, it'll all just pan out because I'll just pray every day and say, God, forgive me again. And God is faithful. And the word says that. That he's faithful to forgive me. If I bring my stuff to him, I petition God, forgive me. I'm sorry. In Jesus name, I did it again. Some of you know what this feels like. I'm struggling, God, again. I lost my temper, again. 
I drank this. I ate that. I went here. I hung out with these people. I overdid it again. I, I, I just, I can't, I can't stop. I, for God, forgive me. I watched this thing on the computer that I shouldn't. God, forgive me. Help me. Whatever it is. I, there's so many things we do. I was prideful. I was arrogant. I thought I was better than her. I started this. I offended some. All of that. All of that. Listen. I need to humble myself and repent every day. I do. I do. It's not the law that I follow to gain Jesus. It's Jesus I follow to help me overcome the law. It's by grace that I overcome those things that I can't on my own. Is this clear? Look, you may be saved a long time. We still need to hear this. We still need to hear this. You might be saved 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We still need to hear this. Lord, I am saved by grace, not by my own works. Not by my own works, but by your blessing, by your, your sacrifice of your son, Jesus. That's how I'm saved. Second Corinthians says this in chapter 5, 17. In case you're still wondering whether I'm just allowed to do whatever I want, here it is. Second Corinthians 5, 17. When you accept Christ, here's what your life looks like. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become what? A new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. What does that mean? It means the things I struggle with will begin to shift and change. And he will help me overcome those things I cannot do on my own because I am what? A new creation. I didn't deserve, it doesn't make me any better than someone on the street. I could be walking down the street and someone that doesn't know Jesus is passing me. I love them. My heart goes out to them. I'm not better than them. I was them, if not worse than them, before I knew Jesus. Otherwise, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. Oh, Jesus, spare me from myself. Spare me from thinking that, well, I've done this a pretty long time. I'm kind of good at this. Religion is all about what I do. Christianity is all about what Jesus does. Someone say amen. Listen, you don't fix all the rules and make sure your heart is repaired so you can come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He'll repair. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. God is not out to end your fun. He's not a killjoy God. That's not what he does. He didn't lay burdens on you. He said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Watch. Let me help you. Let me do this for you. Can we just stand up and pray? We're going to close right now. Father, we just, as we worship you this, eve, this morning, God, as we've heard your word, as we've watched you move through worship, through the offering, through the baby dedication, we see the love that floats around. We know, Christ, that your Holy Spirit is within us and you've made us a new creation. I pray that you would help us to spend time in your presence. God, that we would be moved by your love. Stir us up. God, you so love the world that you sent your only son so that I could have peace, so that I could sleep restfully, so that I know when I, that I know that when I breathe my last, I will be in heaven. God, you did that for me. Will you help us, oh God, today to understand, God, that the thing that describes me as a Christian to the people around me should be love, should be kindness, not legalism. Not me laying down ro rules and regulations. God, help us break our hearts for the lost. Today we pray, break our hearts for the lost. Help us to reach out however we need to, to bless them, to help them, to be kind to them. I wanted you to think about that because I really want us to, before we close this service, to understand everything about the grace God has given me. Everything about the grace... God has given me is not so that I can live a comfortable, peaceful life and have a good conscience. Everything that God has given me, with the grace that he's given to me, is so that I can share it with someone else. So that I can bless them in any way, shape, or form. I might preach to them. I might just give them money for food. I might just hug them and that's it because I don't have time to do anything else. But that's what God gave us. An understanding of who we are in him. Sinners saved by grace. Nothing more. God will raise you up. He'll make you a leader and he'll give you authority and he'll make you accountable for great things. And he does all of that, but he does all of that. He does all of that. We don't do any of that. You with me? Father, I thank you for your grace. I do. 
I thank you for your mercy. As you love us, help us to love you too and be contagious about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to invite you to come Wednesday. Uh, be with us. If not, we have Sunday hang times for the youth right now. Listen, if you're here and you want to pray or you want to talk to one of us, please come up. It's always time and opportunity to pray at this altar. God bless you.